Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox, I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 67 of Compliance Into the Weeds, the only weekly podcast that takes a compliance or compliance-related topic, and with my co-host Matt Kelly, we go into the weeds for a deep dive discussion. Today we take a look at the indictments against five KPMG employees and partners and one former PCAOB uh, professional around the uh, theft of information from the PCAOB uh, to KPMG about audits the uh, PCAOB would do on KPMG. This were fairly stunning within the audit industry, and Matt and I unpack what it may mean for KPMG, what it may mean for persons who rely on KPMG audits, what it may mean for the PCAOB, and the PCAOB's oversight at the SEC. It's a really stunning case that uh, is going to go on for quite a while, so we just start off with a discussion on it today. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds, the only podcast that takes a deep dive literally into the weeds for a compliance or compliance-related topic each week. As always, I'm joined by my now brother-in-arms, and thank you for that moniker, Matt Kelly, founder and uh, editor of Radical Compliance. Matt joins us from the left coast today, uh, but we have one of the juiciest stories that uh, he and I have ever seen outside of, uh, certainly in the auditing field since uh, Enron, but uh, maybe for for quite some time. And it's, of course, the criminal indictments against the five former KPMG executives for um, purloining of information from the uh, Public Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, the PCAOB. So, Matt, with uh, that introduction, first of all, welcome. Thanks for getting up uh, early to uh, record a podcast. And uh, why don't you, uh, with uh, some amazement, set the story for us? Yeah, sure, Tom. This has to be I mean, this case is really beyond the pale. And you and I have talked about an awful lot of oddball corporate misconduct cases. This goes right on the top layer of the cake. Um, So it started on, I think, Monday, the Securities and Exchange Commission announced it had charged six people uh, in connection with this scandal, five of whom had worked at the KPMG, one of whom, the sixth, had worked at the PCAOB, but not KPMG. And two of the five had also worked at the PCAOB and then went to KPMG. So we're going to have a lot of acronyms here. That's not ideal. But basically, what seems to have happened is one of the higher ups in the regulatory agency, the PCAOB, a man named Brian Sweet, he started this, that in 2015, he was interviewing for a job at KPMG, and he was one of the more senior officials overseeing the PCAOB's inspections of audits that firms like KPMG would do. So Brian Sweet told the people he was interviewing with, two partners, David Middendorf and Tom Whittle, he said he could bring sensitive data from from the PCAOB over to KPMG about which audits the agency was planning to look at for KPMG and the coming inspection cycle, and what specific areas of focus they would be looking at for these audits of, that KPMG had already done so that you know KPMG would have an enormous advantage to try to get ahead of unpleasant inspection reports. That's really what was motivating them. Um, Middendorf and Whittle at KPMG, they said, awesome. They hired him. They got the data. Uh, Then other KPMG people started to clean up the work papers of the audits that would be inspected ahead of those inspections. So they're altering documents. They're altering evidence. This is just serious, serious misconduct. Um, And then I circle back to the remaining three or four people here who are still not named. Um, Then the more PCAOB officials started getting on this train. So... Cynthia Holder, who worked at the agency, she called up Brian Sweet and said, look, I want to do the same thing. I'm going to bring over more intel and you get KPMG to hire me. And they did. Then there was another PCAOB employee. His name was Jeff Wada. Jeff Wada called up Cynthia Holder, now at KPMG, and says, I'm ready to go too. 
I have all the classified data, and there is an actual text message they intercepted where Weta told Cynthia Holder, I have the grocery list, which was all of the audits that the agency was planning to inspect. And then he wanted to bring that over to KPMG as well. Now, bad news for Jeff Weta, he did not get hired at KPMG. Um, this all happened from mid-2015, when Brian Sweet started, to early 2017. Um, by that point, somebody at KPMG had blown the whistle to the senior ad managers of the firm about this. So that's when people started getting fired. Jeff Weta never did get his dream job at KPMG. Um, and then between early 2017 and today, that's when the SEC and the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York started investigating, charges have been filed, and all of these details are now coming out in these complaints. I mean, this is just, this is shocking for senior executives at these agencies and audit firms that are supposed to be the gatekeepers, supposed to be the ones that adhere to a higher standard. All of this went out the window in this really sizzling, juicy scandal that is leaked out now with the criminal indictments and the SEC charging statements. And it's, uh, you don't even know what to say to it. So let me just add one fact uh, that uh, one additional fact to your great summary, Matt, and that is both Sweet and Holder's jobs, it's been reported, were threatened if they did not continue to provide information. So um, kind of a, in a reverse extortion um, uh, situation, they had to continue to provide this information to the three supervisors, Middle Middendorf, Whittle and uh, Britt. So um, it, it's and and as you said, uh, Middendorf was the then national managing partner for audit quality and professional practice. Whittle was the then partner in charge for inspections, and Britt was uh, then the capital markets and banking group co leader. So these are uh, very senior folks at KPMG, and uh, you know we we laughed about what were they thinking, but I. You know, I have to go way beyond that. I mean, this is not professional misconduct. Uh, obviously, this is criminal conduct, but yep. this is actual intention, intentional criminal misconduct, at least as alleged, uh, to violate about every standard there is um, for a um, big three auditor. Yeah. And, you know, this really, you're, you're right. I mean, we joke about it because there's so many bizarre, sizzling little details coming out, but this is really egregious misconduct. I have to admit, I didn't yet know that detail that the KPMG partners were leaning on Holder and uh, Sweet and the others to keep on keep the gravy train coming. Um, I know that some people listening might say, okay, yeah, this is salacious, but really, what does this matter to the public at large? It does matter a lot. For example, if you are an investor and your company, the company you are investing in is audited by KPMG, you cannot now know that a clean audit report from KPMG is actually trustworthy. Because even if the PCAOB said, we looked at that company, we looked at that audit, it sounds great. Well, KPMG people were altering documents to make it look good and make it look great. It might have been crap. We don't know. But that's the issue, is that investors are supposed to be able to rely on these audits, and right now they can't. Um, it is worth noting that the Securities Exchange Commission and the PCAOB have fallen all over themselves in the past week to make statements saying that they believe they have measured the depth of this infection um, and that it is not pervasive. Uh, I don't know exactly how many audits, but you know, KPMG audits a huge number of companies. So it is a tiny percentage, and they believe that they have contained this. They believe that, well, at least nobody has said that there might be questions about other firms, as has happened before elsewhere. Um, but they're going to great lengths to try and assuage investors' fears that suddenly you can't rely on audit reports. Um, it's it's a very sensitive issue for capital markets. This is a big deal. So, Matt, I'd like to give a huge shout out to our friend and colleague, Francine McKenna, at Market Watch. Uh, as we were discussing, she has been all over this story. And frankly, if there was ever one story that one person was born to write, um, this may be the story that Francine McKenna was born to write. Uh, she uh, blogged extensively, and now she's moved to Market Watch, Wall Street Journal Company, and uh, is now a full time journalist. And in her most excellent piece uh, that we're going to link to in the show notes, she quoted uh, a statement from Jay Clayton that, um, let's see, said, 
um, that I do not believe today's actions against these six individuals will adversely affect the ability of SEC regist- registrants to continue to use audit reports issued by KPMG and filings with the commission or for investors to rely upon those required reports. I understand politically why he may have had to say this, but uh, I'm with completely with you on this point that we, we don't know and we can't know. And if we have the top people uh, literally running uh, national practice groups at KPMG uh, doing this, um, you know, wh- where else and what else? Obviously, KPMG is is having to ask some answer some very difficult questions around their uh, auditing of the Gupta family in in South Africa. And now with the uh, receivership of the Carillion, uh, the UK construction company. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I suppose that's uh, standard, though. The big three would have to answer some, some tough questions about other issues. But uh, the trust factor, what does it say about KPMG's culture, um, particularly this part about, uh, as you said, um, uh, suite and holders' jobs being threatened. They got leaned on by their uh, management and superiors. Um, it's difficult to believe that this information was simply contained to these five people. In the indictments, there were unnamed parties, partners one, two, three, four, and five, who were explicitly told by Sweet that their audits would be inspected. Uh, those partners were not named. So it's, it's not clear if they'll be named on a criminal or, or, or later civil action. Partner five is the, identified as the partner who notified uh, the scheme to his superiors and then to the firm's general counsel, uh, who then uh, reported the misconduct to regulators. But what does it say about the culture at KPMG that such something someone was able to come into the firm uh, with um, based on uh, – bringing stolen information from a government regulator, circulate that information inside the firm, be told you have to continue to provide this information or you will lose your job, and the firm act upon that information. How does such a culture uh, of the watchers, who's watching the watchers? Those are all excellent questions that we don't know the answer to yet. Um, I think it is a very good point to mention that you know, we don't. We, we do know other people – seem to be taking advantage of this information. We do not know exactly how many. We know apparently there are at least five. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know if they may be charged. Perhaps they've already been fired from KPMG. Um, Maybe there are more beyond the five. Maybe we have not yet heard the end of this. Um, One thought that has come to my mind is, you know, looking at how senior these executives were at KPMG who were really engaging willfully in criminal misconduct. That's what it seems to look like. Um, I actually think of the FCPA corporate enforcement policy from a couple of months ago where they announced that a company would get a declination as a presumption unless there were really aggravating circumstances such as senior executives involved in the misconduct. This is not an FCPA case, but this kind of looks like aggravating circumstances to me. I'm not entirely sure because even at, you know, it might sound like five or 10 senior executives is a big deal, but KPMG is a huge firm. So we don't really know how far up the top this did go. Um, but this is alarming. And if this could somehow lead to a criminal action against the firm itself, that's the nightmare scenario for a lot of people, including KPMG, certainly. But there are only four big four firms left. And there are real questions that if there was criminal misconduct at one of them, could three big three firms still manage all of the public company audit work that is out there? Um, so that's there are a lot of people who would say that the big four firms now are too big to fail. I think that is a reasonable idea to raise. But you know, if it ever came out that this was widespread and rampant, either at this firm or any other, and you wanted to indict a firm criminally, like. You know, that would cause chaos in the public markets. Um, that would be upheaval that would give every CFO in the country heartburn. Um, so I don't know that I don't know what they would do. I think a lot of people are hoping that this is a very egregious thing that is very contained so that they don't have to keep you know, raising the specter of more serious action against the firm overall. 
So along those lines, Francine, in her piece, also quoted a fellow named Jim Peterson, former in-house attorney for Arthur Anderson, uh, for the following, uh, quote, I doubt the KPMG firm will be subject to any sanctions or its global network harmed by this episode. I really, uh, the first part of that statement really ties into the point you raised, Matt, because, um, you know, what put Arthur Anderson under was sustaining a guilty verdict. They lost their ability to audit public companies. If KPMG uh, also sustained some sort of guilty verdict or had to take a guilty plea, would that put them in the same situation? And would it raise all, uh, all of the issues and innumerable more uh, if uh, KPMG goes down? Having said that, um, literally the senior management, you know, the, the national practice leaders at least are alleged to have run this scheme and continued to do so multiple times. So what's the um, the level of, of senior management knowledge here, and is that going to turn around to bite them? And, and I think uh, if we go back to the Yates memo, um, certainly – uh, Sally Yates was trying to communicate, we will go after individuals, and they have done so in this case. But what's the responsibility of the company? And in my mind, at this point, it's still an open question. It is, I think, an open question. Um, you know, one other point that somebody did raise to me, I think is worth mentioning, is this really does call into question the revolving door uh, metaphor out there, the re revolving door stereotype between the PCAOB and the auditing world. Um audit partners are paid very well. And so I, you do have to think about, should there be some sort of restrictions on the PCAOB for sending its, letting its staff go to work at accounting firms? Um, I'm sure PCAOB staffers would not like that because many of them are not necessarily paid as well as they could be in the private market. Um, but I mean, when you look at what happened here, this was one person saying to KPMG, if you bring me over, I'll take some good juicy data. They did. They loved it. And then they brought in the next one and they were going to bring in the next one. And if this had not been exposed, who knows how long this would have gone on. Um, so you do have to raise uh, questions about the revolving door between public and private sector and whether or not we could do something about that, too. You know, that's a great point, and it's something that I think about uh, a lot in the context, obviously, of the FCPA, the Department of Justice, and SEC. Um, but here we have, in, in uh, the FCPA context, it's prosecutors and lawyers at the SEC regulating or prosecuting companies. But here it's the watchers, the PCAOB, uh, watching those who watch public companies. So uh, it's an even closer relationship. Uh, I don't want to say more invidious because that's it's it's not a negative relationship, but it, it's um, I think much more entwined uh, and much closer than uh, the prosecutors and lawyers from the Securities and Exchange prosecutors from DOJ and lawyers from the Securities and Exchange Commission. But to tell people uh, if you leave your mid-level or low-paying government job, you cannot go to work for one of these firms for one, two, three, or five years. Um, that's a that's a huge burden. Yes, it is. I don't know what the answer is. I would have said previously before this that the answer is I rely on the professionalism of government employees. Um, but certainly in this case, that did not hold true. And, you know, I, I also have to wonder what is going through the minds of the PCAOB leadership right now, who are all new people. Don't forget that just several weeks ago, the Securities and Exchange Commission did finally replace all of the leaders of the five members of the PCAOB, and there's a new chairman there. Um, I suspect this is the last problem they wanted to deal with because these new leaders, I think that they have an agenda of their own, partly to work with a lot of new accounting standards that are out there, but also that they want to revisit Sarbanes-Oxley compliance and how to alleviate some of the compliance burdens there. That is a top mission for the Securities and Exchange Commission. And now suddenly this blows up in their face. Um, I think they would like to make sure that the explosion is as small and quickly passing as possible, because if this becomes a big thing, that's going to be a gigantic consumption of time and resources and attention at the PCAOB that they really do not want. Matt, perhaps uh, you could give a few words about the relationship of the PCAOB to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Sure. So 
The PCAOB was created by the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002 to provide an independent regulator of public accounting firms. Um, the way it works is there is a five-member board whose members are basically selected by the SEC. Um, specifically, the chairman gets to the chairman of the SEC gets to select who will be nominated, and then they are voted on by the full five-member commission of the Securities and Exchange Commission. But because the PCAOB has had a lot of political difficulties in recent years, what had wound up happening was that we had a chairman staying well beyond his term, two others staying well beyond their term, and a seat on the PCAOB that was vacant. So that gave the new SEC chairman, Jay Clayton, a unique opportunity to pretty much replace the entire five members of the public, accounting, public company accounting oversight board. And he did. Um, so there are five new people there. They seem to be reasonable candidates. I know some people might not just uh, like some of the new members there or not. But, you know, all five are reasonable, credible people to lead the agency. But it was just a unique political chain of events that allowed the Securities and Exchange Commission to replace the whole PCAOB leadership at a stroke. Uh, so they have a lot of power to be able to do what I think Jake Clayton would like them to do. Um, and, you know, they, they do work at a remove. They do have a lot of independence. Every big standard the PCAOB puts forth has to be approved by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Its budget has to be approved. But uh, those are pretty much rubber stamp things. Um, so it will be interesting to see how the two agencies kind of work together to go forward. Uh, they both have some enforcement powers. Uh, so in theory, the Securities and Exchange Commission could fine KPMG. The PCAOB could fine KPMG. Um, the PCAOB could discipline the auditors who got fired uh, from the firm. Um, the Securities and Exchange Commission could bring charges against them, refer it to the criminal action, which is what happened. Uh, but it's um, a, a sibling relationship, I'll put it that way. But the Securities and Exchange Commission is the older sibling in this relationship. So um, I guess really at this point, Matt, we, we can't make any predictions, and we'll just have to sort of end this podcast with uh, more to come. Uh, yeah, and I suspect there will be more to come, and I don't think any of it is going to be very good for the firm. Well, Matt, as always, uh, it's been a pleasure, and look forward to continuing the conversation next week. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast as it would help in our rankings and help get the word out about literally the only deep dive compliance related podcast on a weekly basis. Also, if you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. Thank you again for listening to this week's episode, and I hope you'll join us again next week where we take a deep dive literally going into the compliance weeds. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.